Okay, so I'll begin. Uh, my name is Bobby Ilk. I am an architect in Ottawa, and I'm also a part-time professor at Algonquin College uh, in the Interior Design Program in Ottawa. Uh, I'm also, I guess, a part owner of uh, BuildWise, which is one of the sponsors. We are a prefab clay and straw wall panel system company, and uh, well, we're trying to manufacture more natural building products. So uh, yeah, we're based uh, largely in Ottawa and I guess Carleton Place with that. Uh, I'm here today to give you a discussion on building biology. Has everyone heard of the Institute of Building Biology? A few of them out there. Okay, that's good. That's good. I mean, this this is. I mean, a lot of you are on page or on par for what I'll be discussing. Uh, building biology. If we get into this, uh, so building biology recognizes that nature is the gold standard for a healthy human environment and the ultimate model for perpetual ecological balance. So the idea here is what is natural for us is natural or uh, healthy for the environment. So health goes both ways. Uh, there is a little bit of text on uh, upcoming slides, so bear with me. There's lots of images to come. Building biology is unique on its emphasis on human health with the perspective that there is almost a, a direct correlation between the biological compatibility of the building material and its ecological performance. In other words, that which is truly healthy for us will also be healthy for the environment. Uh, it, uh, building biology is not a narrowly specialized subject. Building biologists exist around the world, and uh, they come in all forms and uh, shapes and forms and sizes. But it is a living subject that brings together fields of study that are otherwise only taught in isolation. Building biology was founded in Germany by a group of professionals from a variety of disciplines concerned about the inability of post-war housing to support health and ecology. Uh, building biology has its roots in Germany, where it was initially formulated in the 1960s in response to the scourge of building-related illnesses associated with post-war construction, the, which we still see. Uh, this new science of healthy building became known as Bolbaligi, the International Institute for Building Biology and Ecology was established in North America in 1987. So it was translated from German text and brought over to North America. It's really based on 25 principles, which have been adjusted over the course of uh, you know, uh, you know, the last 30, 40 years that it has been in North America. Uh, but you know, for the most part, they are all relatively the same from the 1960s. So we have site and community design, four main categories, occupant health and well-being, natural and man-made electromagnetic safety, and environmental protection, social responsibility, and energy efficiency. The first principle is verify that the site is free of naturally occurring health hazards. Again, if you build on a sick site, it's likely that you're going to be sick from it. And if you encounter stuff like radon, well, you have to mitigate for it. The second is place dwelling so occupants are undisturbed by sources of man-made oil, soil, water, noise, and electropollution. So there's a various of different pollutions that come into play with what would be deemed by building biology standards a healthy house. Place dwellings in a well-planned communities that provide ample access to fresh air, sunshine, sunshine and nature. So even in urban centers where you know you have very different air quality than let's say here, uh, fresh air is still considered by building biology standards much more important for our health uh, than any other type of filtered or mechanical distributed air. For planned homes and developments, considering the needs of community, families, and individuals of all ages. So mixed use is always uh, uh, you know, promote it. So we get into occupant health and well-being. Number five is use natural and unadulterated building materials. 
now. I mean, most of you have a good grasp on why that is important, so I won't elaborate too far on that. Uh, six, allow natural self-regulation of indoor air humidity using hygroscopic humidity buffering building materials. Has anyone heard the term hygroscopic before? Yeah, yeah, good, good. Again, every audience, uh, hygroscopic is, you know, the ability for material to take in moisture uh, safely and then re-release it again. Clay is phenomenal at this, so uh, it's, you know, it, that's why, you know, in a natural building world, we do like using stuff like wood and clay. Straw. And straw. Lots of straw. Lots of straw. <laughs> but straw doesn't have a hydric buffering capacity. <laughs> the, clay, the clay acts as that humidity buffering. So seven is assure low total moisture content and rapid desic desiccation of wet construction processes in new buildings. Like plastering or doing building with, let's say, clay straw or uh, rammed earth, you do need to successfully dry that building. If it remains wet, you're going to run into problems. Designed for a climatically appropriate balance between thermal insulation and therm thermal storage capacity, building biology uh, sees a real emphasis on thermal mass. They do, even if it's internal thermal mass, they do recommend that it does help on very, or a lot of different levels. Nine is plan for clim climatically appropriate surface and air temperature. Pretty straightforward. Provide for ample ventilation. This I can't stress enough. Uh, we're doing a living building challenge just south of Ottawa right now, and uh, that's been a challenge to say the least. But uh, one of the big requirements for, well, as an architect for any building, is to have operable windows. Now, our mechanical engineer in this case, uh, you know, we're trying to do an earth tube uh, system about bringing our fresh air in, and, you know, he's pretty set on if this system is going to work the way I want it to work we shouldn't have any operable windows during those hot seasons when hot air can come in. Well, of course, my client doesn't like to hear that. So, you know, we've had to really struggle to find that, find balance for what a mechanical system can and should do. And, you know, really the importance of bringing in the fresh air through a window. Use appropriate thermal radiation strategies for heating buildings, including passive solar, wherever viable. I'll get into this a lot uh, more, but uh, radiant heat is the only type of heat that uh, building biology would recommend. Provide an abundance of well-balanced natural light and illumination while using color in accordance with nature. So again, natural light is the best light we can possibly have. The best solution we could do is to have indoor spaces that don't need to turn on any lights during the course of the day. So if you design for that, uh, that is considered you know, your best, best options. And of course, colors in accordance with nature, when you use natural products, they are going to have those colors. Provide adequate acoustical protection from harmful noise and vibration. Uh, this, this goes, I guess, twofold. One, you know, the outside noises that come in if you're in an apartment from one area to another. There's also the sounds and noises that come from inside the building itself, like HRV or an HVAC system and uh, other mechanical components. We were told about those uh, exhaust fans uh, just in the last lecture, and I don't know, most exhaust fans are yeah, they're contributing to a lot of noise inside of a kitchen. Utilize non-toxic building materials that have neutral or pleasant natural scents. Pretty straightforward, and most of you agree and believe this, otherwise you wouldn't be here. Use appropriate water and moisture exclusion techniques to prevent interior growth of fungi, bacteria, dust, and allergens. Again, proper building science and building techniques. Uh, building biologists, for the most part, you can build a flat roof 
building biology, you know, home. The, the biggest difference is that they do recommend using strategies that will help you shed water before it ever has the opportunity to come in. So to try to mitigate that. 16, assure best possible potable water quality by applying purification technologies if required. Water is, it's interesting. They, they stress water importance on almost every level that, uh, that you deal with. And this is you know, directly related to the water we consume. But uh, I, I'm always shocked at all these different conferences and everything else that we're not talking more about water. There's lots of conversations on energy and, uh, you know, which I do agree on, but we require water to live. We can't be separated from it. And, uh, you know, with that said, we could live without electricity if we had to. Water is essential and it should be at the forefront of a lot of natural uh, conversations. So, so I, I'm glad it's one of their primary points. 17, utilize physiological and ergonomic knowledge in interior and furniture design. 18, consider proportion, harmonic measure, order, shape, and design. As an architect, again, these are just using very base principles of harmonics in design. And now we get into natural man-made electromagnetic radiation safety. Are, how many of you are familiar with the term EMR or EMF? Good, good. Okay, so I won't spend as much time as sometimes I have to, to, to at least bring the attention there. Building biology, for whatever reason, they're one of the first places that I've been introduced to EMR and EMF safety, RF safety. And, uh, it, you know, they focus a lot on it. And... Um, yeah, it, it's interesting that uh, that the strategies and some of the you know very simple strategies aren't used more in standard construction. Is uh, they can go a long way. So point nineteen is minimize indoor interference with vital cosmic and terrestrial radiation. So these are stuff that come from outside and the earth. Uh, Twenty minimize man-made power system and radio frequency radiation exposure generated from within the building and from outside sources. So these are our, yes, frequencies. Sorry if I'm ahead, but yeah. um, are you, do you want to talk about some of the strategies for actually doing that? I will. I will get into it, yes, yes. Great. Yeah, and, they, and I don't want to bore everyone. I'm trying to get the points down because these are essential to understanding just how complex building biology take buildings, you know, and. Uh, the 25 principles, literally most of these, except for some of our, you know, man-made power systems and frequencies, which didn't exist at that point in time, uh, were integrated from, you know, last 60, 70 years. So there's a bunch of experts that came together in Germany that really dove into this. So I will get into a little bit of the strategies, but probably not nearly as much as you would probably like me to, because it, it's, it's a long conversation. I have a beer. Yes. Yes. 21. Avoid use of building materials that have elevated radioactivity le levels. Tim had mentioned uh, granite countertops. A lot of us, uh, I, again, until I took some building biology courses, I had no idea there were radioactive or radon uh, traces in <coughs> granite countertops. They didn't teach me that at school. So, uh, yeah, it, it's interesting, but it does. It does contain radon. Not all of them, but if you are planning to use granite in a uh, you know, chemically sensitive person's home, you do have to take measurements. That is something, and it should be part of what you do. 22. Construction materials, production, and building processes shall provide for health and social well-being in every phase of the building's life cycle. So again, think about where it comes from. Again, local natural materials, we are all on board with those. 23, avoid the use of building materials that deplete irreplaceable natural resources or are being harvested in an unsustainable manner. Again, I think we all tend to have a good background in, in a lot of those points. 
24 is minimize energy consumption throughout the life of the building, utilizing climate-based and energy-efficient design, energy and water-saving technologies, and renewable energy. And the last point, that's exhausting. Consider the embodied energy and environmental life cycle costs when choosing all materials used in construction. Again, uh, carbon, uh, you know, everything from carbon sequestering to all of the, the principles that uh, we've talked about so often in our uh, different conferences. So building biology, one, I mean, this is a common analogy. I have, has anyone heard of the rain barrel analogy? Yeah, uh, there would be a handful of them. The, the idea here, and this isn't building biology, this is very common in a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of circles that deal with natural, uh, you know, remedies, I guess. But the idea is that the human body is a rain barrel, and everything we're exposed to slowly fills up that rain barrel. Each one of us are different. So what gets filled in can affect us differently. So some of us might be more, you know, prone to, uh, let's say, formaldehyde. We might be sensitive to it. So that would fill up a lot quicker. If you're not, you know, as sensitive to formaldehyde, it's still filling up, but maybe not at the same rate. Uh, the food we eat, that's all part of this. I mean, it goes much further beyond just the buildings we have. Uh, the, the point is, once that rain barrel is full, it tends to overflow, and that's when we get into chronic illnesses and, uh, you know, and diseases and all other, you know, things that might come from it. Quite often that last tipping point or the last little part that fills that rain barrel is often thought of as the cause of the illness, but in reality a lot of people who suffer from, you know, building syndrome illnesses tend to, tend to have other underlining issues that can come into play. So it's often, you know, the last little tipping point that makes them realize they have symptoms. Now, with the rain barrel, what I've always looked at is, imagine your rain barrel full, and this can be filled over, you know, 50 years or 30 years, whatever it is. Imagine eating McDonald's every day for 30 years. That's going to rise pretty quickly. Now, it would be very difficult for us to bring that down. So it's not that it just overflows, but how do you repair it? How do you get your body so your symptoms go down enough so that you're not affected by, you know, maybe a little bit of exposure to this, that, or the other. Now imagine 30 years of continuous, you know, which we all tend to do, but of something like formaldehyde in an airtight building where there is not enough ventilation. Now there's, uh, you know, we're all exposed to big levels. So even if you're not highly sensitive to formaldehyde, that can add up gradually over a course of time and it can lead to all sorts of different illnesses. So one of the main components building biologists started looking at was, is there a successful history of use? Why are these new modern buildings acting very different from the buildings that were built for, you know, hundreds of years prior to World War II. Uh, humans have always created durable shelter within the closed circuit of nature, no waste, no pollution, using the natural materials at hand, until very recently. This is a photo of uh, a wattle and daub construction with timber frame. Uh, wattle and daub is very similar to light straw clay. And, uh, you know, here we can see a lifespan of eight, nine hundred years. So, they started looking at the idea that maybe mass wall construction had something to do with it. In fact, it has a lot to do with it. The way it deals with moisture, like what Dee had uh, mentioned during her presentation. Uh, straw bale, clay straw, rammed earth, uh, stone wall, all of these systems, a mass wall system has the ability to take on moisture and allow it to pass through its wall safely. And that's critical, critical to the longevity of the building, but also the health effects. So part of the mass wall construction is again, what climate are you building in? So there has to be a balance of thermal mass and insulation, 
which equals maximum comfort and energy efficiency. This is actually a home that uh, Paula Baker Laporte. Does anyone know Paula Baker Laporte? Yeah, a few. Yeah, she's, she's become one of my mentors. A lot of these are her slides too. I've yet to find anything that describes building biology better than that. So, uh, she, yeah, these, these are pretty powerful images. And this is an Adobe home just out of Santa Fe. I have seen this home during one of my building biology uh, uh, seminars. And uh, yeah, it's as magical as you would vision it from the photo. The high grit buffer capacity. So what's abilities or a building's ability to take on moisture? Because there's going to be moisture in that building. Building biology have taken that under their wing. They know water's going to get in and what can this building do to sustain it? So the top example, there's a steel structure building, probably standard, you know, maybe rock wool or foam insulation and uh, you know, your drywall interior. And down below we have a log hole. The first one has a five gallon or approximate five gallon capacity. Now what's important is the comparison to the log home which has a 17,000 gallon capacity. Natural buildings have the capacity to take on moisture and that's very, very critical to understanding moisture related problems in buildings. If you have a building that can't take on any moisture and moisture is going to get in at one point or another, what happens to that moisture? It tends to deteriorate everything that it comes in contact with. One of the most critical, or one of the, the I thought, interesting analogies that building biology approaches is the building envelope as our third skin. So the first skin is our, of course, skin on our body. It's a pretty miraculous thing. When we get too hot, it sweats and it leaves us, you know, bent itself. It allows that moisture out. During the other times where we are too cold, it creates little air pockets, goosebumps. And that creates an insulative value to our body and it allows us to stay warm. The second uh, skin would be, of course, our clothing. Any of you who, I mean, can't compare cotton or wool with polyester. That, you know, gives you an insight into a little bit what they're referring to. Third skin, from a building biology perspective, would be the building itself. And uh, this comes into the play of no vapor barriers. Powerful, powerful image. Now imagine yourself inside that plastic, breathing. You can see the vapor forming on the inside of that, that bag. Yeah, not pleasant. I mean, we wouldn't do this. So why do we do this? It's, uh, you know, it goes much further into it. From a building science point of view, if buildings are detailed properly and you use materials that can take on moisture, you don't necessarily need to do this or only do it in areas that are vulnerable. This is interesting. I bring this up because I'm in the building code way too much. Yeah. This is, uh, uh, is anyone familiar with this table in part nine, appendix A? Yeah, great, great table. And it just scrapes the surface of the perm rating of materials. Very critical. Table A, for those of you writing this down, 925.5.1, sentence one, refers to this table. And it really describes air and vapor permeance of materials, standard materials that we use every day. I've highlighted two there. I don't know if you can see them or not. One is 11 millimeter OSB. Uh, what's interesting is the water vapor is a range of about 44 perm or 44 ng, which is less than one perm. One perm is the definition in the building code of a vapor retarder. 
So if it has a vapor permeance of more than that, you cannot use it for a vapor barrier. But if it is under that, which OSB is, it is considered a vapor retarder. The other interesting one is plywood. If you look at it, it's from 40 to 57. That again is a vapor retarder. How many buildings have you seen with either OSB or plywood on the outside? Couple? <laughs> yeah, all of them is right. It, it, it's a double vapor barrier system. And it, again, there's a lot more complexity there, but we are building vulnerable buildings, fundamentally. And I don't know why this is not addressed more. On roofs, our building code has come to the realization that a plywood roof will need a ventilated space underneath it. And we are required to put in a two and a half inch gap underneath plywood. But for an exterior wall system, we do not. And on top of it, we are including more insulations that are also non-permeable, that are also vapor barriers. So we're creating a stronger vapor barrier on the outside of our buildings than the inside. And this is becoming pretty standard practice. This is Stephen Collette. He is a neighbor of all of you. He lives in Lakefield. He's a building biologist who teaches a lot of these seminars. Stephen Collette has been a building biologist for a very long time. And most of his work is going into buildings like this and assessing why someone might be sick <laughs> or why the building has to be torn down. This, this is just that. It's mulchal. I mean, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's very, very uh, unfortunate. But again, the way we build, we build very vulnerably. So, uh, you know, even, and, you know, I, I haven't seen a lot of uh, reports that show this, but from a building biology perspective, they encounter a lot of these circumstances. The, one of the biggest causes of mold growth is the little paper backing on drywall. It's crazy. Because on one side of it is a poly vapor barrier, and the other side of it is often a vapor barrier again, the paint. And when moisture gets in there, it has nowhere to go. So what does it do? It feeds on that cellulose. And of course, if moisture gets in there, it means air is getting in there too. And it has, mold has all the ability and uh, quite often, uh, yeah, those are very vulnerable areas that, uh, who knew, right? But yeah, Stephen Collette, look him up. He has a great website, and uh, I can't say enough good things about Stephen. So we have created a formula for failure. Lightweight synthetic building systems, moisture plus impermeable barriers, Minus hybrid capacity, so the ability to take on moisture, equals building failures, health failures, and environmental failures. What I didn't point out is that most vapor barriers are chemically very toxic. So not only are, do they do certain things to our wall system, they are also very uh, toxic to the environment, not only during its production, but afterwards as well. Building biology has a lot of different standards. I'm going through them fairly quickly, and I want to try wrapping everything together with, I guess, our house construction, just so you can see some examples and so we have time with, uh, with the actual uh, questions that I'm sure a lot of you will have. So there's a standard for healthy heating, and I said it before, it's a sun. The, the sun produces radiant heat. Radiant heat is the only type of heat that is suggested of use in a building biology uh, built house. So radiant, like the sun. Again, we know how the sun heats. If you go outside right now, it, I haven't been outside yet, but it was cool when I got here. And uh, if it's minus 10 outside and you're standing in the sun, you're felt relatively comfortable because the sun using the radiant heat is heating you, your body. It's not heating the air around you. If you walk into the shade, it's going to be quite cool. The difference being is that the sun is not using its energy to heat the air, it's heating you. So when you're standing in the sun, you feel warm, even though the air temperature is still relatively cool. 
And that's uh, really what they're trying to emphasize is the comfort levels and the health aspects of radiant heat. Thermal mass storage creates even comfortable heat. So when you have a little bit of thermal mass inside of a building, that can be a clay plaster, that can be you know an interior uh, masonry heater that I've had the yeah pleasure of getting to know. Uh, you can have you know a stone wall, any type of thermal mass, bricks that are plastered over top will give you some thermal mass. Some thermal mass inside, especially with radiant heat, will store that heat and help contain it and help contain some of those uh, values. They can also look pretty spectacular too. Healthy natural ion balance. Does everyone understand? ion balance. Have you heard those terms before? No? I'll, I'll talk about it in a little more description, but essentially we're talking about positive and negative charges, electrical charges in the air. And these are ions. Ions are just electrical charges. And uh, when we talk about ion balance, we're talking about an equal amount of negative ions along with an equal number or a relatively equal number of positive ions does not blow air, dust, mold, VOCs around. So as you can probably tell, building biology doesn't really like uh, heated systems that rely on heating air. Um, and part of that is the whole idea that ductwork, no matter how clean we think it is, still has difficulty distributing, but building biology would say is truly healthy air. Creates heat zones, avoiding thermal monotony. So, you know, you want to create these little heating zones. If you're not in a room, there's no point of heating it. And that's kind of the concept that, you know, if we prioritize some of our heat, we can start to uh, almost isolate it and becomes very energy efficient. And it's, you know, just the fact we've thought it through. There should be less than a two degree Celsius head to foot temperature difference. You achieve this with radiant heat. It's very difficult to do that with a forced air system. Does not dry dust. Uses very little fuel. It's quiet. It's essential. Air, so that was kind of the heating, kind of just a few points on heating. Uh, air ventilation. They do recognize that in, and it's a very good thing that our buildings are becoming, a, you know, more airtight, more energy efficient, and uh, building biology understands that HRV, ERV are health necessities for airtight uh, sealed construction. It's, it's essential that we have these in place, and they are good things. But how much is enough? So when we look at it, there's one air coming through duct systems, and it is not the same as the air through a window. The idea here, again, is that fresh air coming from outside, if it is as toxic as we think it might be, we probably have a lot worse things to be thinking about. So the fresh air outside is as as healthy as it's going to come from a building biology perspective. Uh, no mechanical system, no amount of reducing those filters and everything else are going to actually help filter that air enough. The biggest problem that uh, I guess uh, bringing in duct air or fresh air is that uh, even from an ion balance point of view, remember I said there are negative uh, ions and positive ions? When air goes through a duct system, especially a metal duct system, so there are some exceptions to that, uh, but when it goes through a metal duct system, the negative ions, the negative charges in the air will stick to the surface of the ductwork. And when the air is distributed, it always has a positive charge, which again, leads to something like static electricity. So really that's what we're talking about, static electricity in buildings. And that's a huge comfort aspect and can lead to all sorts of different uh, health issues. So ionization. To, in order to keep that balance, 
natural building materials, natural components tend to have a real, uh, how you put it, they almost bring in some of that negative uh, ions. Fresh air from outside, there's a real abundance of negative ions in air. And especially air around, you know, a lake or in a forest or where there's abundance of nature, if you will. So natural building materials. We know there's a lot of, uh, you can think, thinking in relation to the opposite. Imagine a carpet, a synthetic carpet, dragging your feet through that carpet and touching something metal. You often have an electrical shock because the negative ions are being stuck and collected inside of that carpet. And so you're generating more positive ions inside the air. Now imagine yourself outside, running your feet through the grass and touching the bark of a tree. You're gonna have a electric shock? Probably not. So their natural materials don't tend to deplete some of those electric charges that I'm talking about. They tend to balance them. So naturally, they become much more comfortable on the inside. Natural unsealed finishes. Radiant heating. It does not deplete any of those electrical charges. Fresh air. Ample fresh air brings in a lot of negative ions, which help balance. EMR reduction. So I, I will talk more about EMR, but uh, if you can reduce some of the EMR components, again, a lot of that's electric charges, little wavelengths, and that tends to deplete a lot of the, you know, the negative ions that are in the air. Plants, plants help contribute. They bring in a lot of negative ions. And then there's the deionization indoors. So we're dealing with forced air heating, uh, stale air, which, you know, isn't usually a case, might be through an earth tube. I'm not, not sure yet. We're, we're, we're planning that for our living building challenge project. Uh, fortunately, our windows will be operable, so if it does deplete some of these things, uh, we'll still be able to open those windows. Synthetic building materials and finishes. This is actually one of the largest causes. Uh, carpets, you can imagine, uh, all sorts of uh, unnatural building products tend to really deplete a lot of the negative ions in the air. Electronic devices, and of course carpeting is one of the most, uh, well, I mean we all know what electric charges feel like. I know I've shocked my sisters more than once. <laughs> Nature-based strategies for thermal comfort and health. So the idea here is use technology as supplement, not life support. Building biology considers a building that's only run on a mechanical system as life support. It's not really using nature and uh, you know outdoor and all these natural products that we have access to that we should continue to use as, as part of that component. Uh, design for climate. Again, Building Biology is an international organization, so they really try to focus on, you know, being climatically correct. Don't deionize the air. Maintain healthy humidity. Design in natural ventilation. So as much as you can, try to have operable windows. That is probably one of the biggest yeah, easiest things to do for natural ventilation. Use mass to store heat. Even in the winter, I've opened my window. I wanted to find out. We just recently moved into our house. It's clay and straw. We have a crazy amount of mass. We have an earthen floor, uh, you name it. There's a lot of mass in this building. So I opened up a window, or a, actually it was a door, our back door. And I left it open for about probably a good half hour while we were burning on the masonry heater. And uh, I mean, the room temperature, the air temperature went down by about two degrees Celsius. And, uh, but you know, I was still comfortable, really was. And uh, honestly, it, right now our room temperature, the air temperature is about 15, 16 degrees in our house. And uh, I've never felt so comfortable in a home. In most homes I've been in the past where I've had the temperature at 15, 16 degrees, it's felt pretty terrible, so but I've only lived with mostly forced air before. Of course, there's the chemical issue. 
if homes had labels. Paula Baker Laporte, uh, she, she wrote a, uh, she's written several books, but one of her biggest ones is Prescriptions for a Healthy Home, which I'll show a, a little bit later. But uh, she got sick uh, living in a lot of conventionally constructed homes. And uh, she didn't find out till about 20 years later that it was actually formaldehyde making her extremely sick. She didn't get better until she moved into an adobe home in Santa Fe. Of course, she didn't really know what was going on. She was an architect at that point, but she started doing a lot of research. She stumbled upon building biology, and she started talking to a lot of doctors who were building biologists, a lot of engineers, and they started to come to a bit of a realization that, you know, the materials we're using are just ridiculously toxic. And this is where, you know, in the food industry, this is very common. You see it everywhere. Why don't we see it on buildings or any material you buy? We don't have full disclosure. And that's a big problem. Chemical companies don't want to disclose what's in their product. Because <laughs> if they did, we probably wouldn't buy it. So an SDS is the best we have. Like, that's one of the best areas we have to see what's in a product. Well, what it does not tell you, health effects of trade secret ingredients. They don't have to disclose these. Hazardous ingredients that are less than our percent. And, you know, a lot of Paula's, uh, and I learn a lot from someone like Paula, because I've just been introduced to, you know, the building biology world. But uh, she's had a lot of sick clients, and a lot of them are sick largely because of these ingredients that are less than 1% from an SDS sheet. Carcinogens of less than 0.01%. Inert ingredients, these can be the most hazardous. PEL and TLV level untested and based on single exposure and set by in industry obtainability. Health effects don't accurately portray long-term synergistic or multiple exposures. So, yes? So what are PEL and TLV looking? Good question. I'd have to go back into my notes. These, this, this is Paula's slide. Ah, okay. Yeah, so I, I unfortunately don't fully, fully know those ones. The, the idea here is that an SDS sheet essentially doesn't say everything. So there's some stuff we need to be looking for. Now, making sense of chemicals for non-chemist, honestly, it's still far over my head, let alone you know the average person looking for a healthy material. Uh, and, and this is part of it. It's a Pandora's box. The, there are 85,000 plus man-made chemicals approved for commerce, and they derive from roughly 88 of the elements found on the periodic table. It's crazy, 85,000 plus. And counting, like we're probably well over 100,000 since this report was done. Nature, of course, the gold standard, it has a 5 billion year track record. And all of the functions and services delivered by living systems found in nature in our environment are the result of the use of these 12 chemicals in the periodic table. They've used 12. Everything, everything we need comes from these 12. But yet, we continue to use the 85,000 other man-made products that come from all the other elements. Some to, definitely some to think about. And at what cost and to whom? I mean, I've, uh, and there's so many reports out there. There was a report I saw from the Wild, or World Wildlife for Better, yeah, Foundation. And they had reported that there's a 70% reduction in freshwater ecosystems and habitats and wildlife in the last 50 years. A 70% reduction. What's Canada? There's a lake right there. That's all we are. 70% reduction. Because we continue to use these chemicals. We don't have to. I mean, all of you know that. We've, we're trying. We're trying. I tell all my students, you know, we have the ability. I agree with Chris. We have the ability to make change. You know, we are the people who specify this stuff. We are the people who build with it. Now, if we choose not to, simply choose not to. 
it will be better for not only our health, but ecological health. This is a great slide. Could be straw bale, could be clay straw, could be round earth, could be after the earth is gone. But the buildings we build naturally go back into the earth again. That's essential. There is a Pacific trash vortex. Has anyone heard of this? Yeah, yeah I'm sure you have. Twice, over twice the size of Texas. And probably still growing. This is a mound for those of you who don't have it. It's a big island that's floating around the Pacific Ocean right now. That it's over twice the size of Texas. And looks like this. Now, I, I'm pleased. This audience, I think 80% of you have said you've at least heard of EMR. So that, that's huge. Most people have not and don't really understand some of the health effects it could have. Again, it's just like the rain barrel. All of us have different sensitivities. And some of us are more sensitive than others and can be affected and our rain barrel filled a little more by depending on what we're, uh, we're more sensitive to. So there's an electromagnetic field, so EMF. These are low electrical frequencies that you often find in power lines, in power distribution, in a plug-in. You have very low frequencies. This is often referred to as dirty electricity. Has anyone heard that term before? Yeah, okay. A lot of you are familiar with that. So this is caused often from transformers or dimmer switches. Uh, the conversion often of AC to DC or vice versa, DC to AC. So in a solar panel, you're collecting direct current and you're converting that to AC in order to use it inside the house. If we just went from direct current into direct current into the house and had appliances that could use a direct current, you wouldn't have any of the VLF or EMF issues. So it's really that conversion that really gives us a lot of those, uh, a lot of those, those components. Um, radio frequencies, RF, high electrical frequencies. These are often from cell phones, Wi-Fi, wireless, smart meters. Again, there's so many studies from both sides. Uh, you know, building biology believe very strongly that this has a lot of lingering health effects, and they do have a lot of courses in it. Uh, you know, there's the other side. Uh, I, I, I curl. I curl a hell of a lot. It's, it's good stuff. But, uh, you know, with, with the most part, one of my, uh, my third on my curling team, uh, he, he's an electrical engineer who pretty much lives on his cell phone because he does a lot of, uh, and, you know, that's, that's his job. That's what he does. And he's convinced it does not have any lingering health effects. I've gotten so many debates with him because I do believe that and I've met people who have you know sensitivities to EMR and you know when they remove it they feel better as simple as that and you know we've kind of come to the conclusion that you know by taking some of these standards and reducing it you know at least while you're sleeping is a huge benefit to the individual because while we sleep we tend to recoup and we tend to regenerate our bodies so part of the process is if you do need these wireless devices on during whatever time of the day, the recommendation would be that you at least unplug it at night so that you're not affected by it while you sleep. Uh, some of the other components, and I'll get into some of the strategies, but uh, some of the electromagnetic fields, you can create shielding. BX actually cable shields a lot of the the wiring frequencies, so a lot of the electric fields and magnetic fields that come off electric wires. So you could use that in some of your homes, especially if your client was, uh, was sensitive. The biggest thing in building biology, they believe in kill switches. Has anyone heard of a kill switch? Essentially, it turns off the power for the room. Now, a light switch, when you turn off the power, it breaks the current, and there's no more current going to that light switch. Essentially, a kill switch will do the same for your plugins. 
it's as simple as that. It just stops the electricity so it doesn't go around you while you're sleeping, so that you're not exposed anywhere near it. This is a, a slide from Safe Living Technologies. Has any of you heard of Safe Living Technologies? Yeah, a few. Um, Rob Metzinger is a building biologist, and he teaches a lot uh, of the EMR components uh, for building biology. He's actually in Ontario, and uh, his company is Safe Living Technologies. And if you are interested in EMR uh, research, uh, his website's uh, very valuable. So Safe Living Technologies. And he has on there an electromagnetic spectrum. But I mean, you could find this anywhere. But it gives you an idea of where these frequencies go and where some of the, you know, the electricity or the very low frequencies that I was referring to. Dirty electricity tends to be on some of the very low frequencies. And then we get into the radio frequencies, which include cell phones, Wi-Fi, and then get into your microwaves. And uh, it's just, and then of course, invisible light. So electromagnetic hypersensitivity, EHS. People who are sensitive to EMR are often diagnosed with EHS. Uh, you know, again, it's, it's hard to be diagnosed with EHS. And uh, often people who are diagnosed with it have to go and travel quite far. Uh, some symptoms can be neurological, uh, cardiac, uh, car oh. <laughs> cardiac uh, respiratory, uh, dermatological, uh, ophthalmologic, and a bunch of others like digestive problems. Uh, I mean, there, like most chemical sensitivities, it's a wide range of symptoms. Some of the most common, though, are migraines and headaches, or the lack of sleep. So, uh, you know, if you have trouble sleeping, sometimes uh, people have been diagnosed. Uh, this is an interesting report. It, uh, this is an excerpt from uh, Marin Paul, a professor of biochemistry. Uh, it can be seen from Dr. Paul's presented research that low-level EMF exposures attack each of the four things we often value most of individuals and as a species. Our health, our brain function, the integrity of our genomes, and our ability to produce healthy offspring. So I wanted to, uh, Paula does this great uh, kind of distribution of some of the points that building biology bring about, and then of course some of our you know, lead and green building components. So building biology really looks as the house as an organism. Green buildings often houses a system. Uh, interdisciplinary base, so you know, doctors, engineers, building scientists, they're all really well researched in this field. Uh, building industry based, again, there are people who tell you that spray foam with a little bit of soy in it is considered healthy. I beg to differ. Anything that you need a full body suit to apply can't be good for anybody, including the environment. Flow through a wall design, so that mass wall construction, how does it deal with moisture? Belt and suspenders kind of approach, where you know, you're dealing with layer upon layer upon layer, and you're trying to fix each layer as you see problems with it. A high hydric buffer capacity, low hydric buffer capacity, a balance of mass and insulation, Green building often look at our value, and that can be seen as quite problematic. Radiant heat, improving forced air heating, passive climate controls, energy efficient technology, fresh air, HRV, ERV. And again, we do need in our climate, again, Paula presents a lot of this to a lot of people in the US where you don't need an HRV or ERV. Well, that can be debated too, depending on how airtight those buildings are. But in Canada, we need an HRV, we need an ERV, and whatever system. We need fresh air during the winter months. I don't recommend, unless you have a lot of mass in your building, to open your window for you know a couple hours every day. I know people who sleep with their window open all year round, and uh, you know it's it's good. It just it's not necessarily energy efficient. So we do require HRVs. 
in Canada. And then some of the other things are ion balance, which I was talking about, those electric, sorption, absorption, and uh, adsorption, unadulterated building materials, light and color balance, EMR concern, geopathology, social impact, history of use, how long has something been used, and green building is, you know, yeah, they don't even touch on those. This is from uh, Regenesis, almost a think tank, or it is a think tank, and uh, it's an interesting quote. Green and eco-efficient design is insufficient because it misses the real potential that arises out of the human presence on the planet. The possibility of organizing human activities so that they continually feed and are fed by the living systems which which they occur. It is not enough to aspire to mitigate the effects of human activity. People need to take their place again as part of nature. So applying some building biology principles. And again, if you have questions at this point, it's probably a good time to ask them as I flow through. If I am going to answer it in the next slide, I'll let you know. So the first base is that it's toxin free. First, do no harm. This is the book I talked to you about, uh, Prescriptions for a Healthy Home. Uh, Paul is actually in the process of updating it for the first, fourth version. And uh, it, it's, it's a great book. I mean, most of you know natural building products very well, so it won't come in maybe, well, a lot of it, it's good, you're, you're aware. But uh, I, I still make reference to Prescriptions for a Healthy Home, and it does, you know, it's one of the required texts as a building biologist, so it's, it's become very important. So the first step, again, toxin-free, don't use those chemicals. A home will be successful to the degree that natural unprocessed unproc buildings are used to create it. So Anton Schneider, he's actually one of the founders of building biology in German, Germany. And that was one of the biggest discoveries when all these people came together was that by the lack of natural materials in some of these conventional buildings that came about after World War II, they, they ran into problems, all sorts of different health problems. And uh, for their purpose is that they had a history of use. They had buildings prior that were built and that they could relate to. So, uh, and one of the biggest thing was, again, a lot of the items I've listed, but mass construction and that history of use. Why do things last as long as they do? So natural, unadulterated building materials. Here's a picture of the sprouting walls on our house when we uh, were constructing. Well, this is from about two years ago. And you can see the sprouting. This is an outside of the house today, or a few days ago. You can see it's still not plastered on the outside. I've done that, well, one for timing. It just never worked out yet to have it plastered. But. Uh, the other aspect is I found it really interesting. The first year I left my walls exposed, the way it dealt with moisture and especially winter months. I, I mean, it makes you a believer to see a building exposed for a year and a half, two years, and see how clay mitigates moisture. It's, uh, yeah, it's made me understand what it is I talk about that much better. This is a photo from a couple days ago. As you can see, the clay straw is like the day we put it in. Natural self-regulation of humidity, ionization and acoustics using hygroscopic building materials and finishes. Again, a lot of you use these naturally. Natural building products are really what we're talking about. Uh, this is my daughter a few months ago. This is the earthen floor that uh, Strawworks had completed. A lot of you are in the crowd who, who were there. And uh, yeah, I mean, clay plaster on the walls, timber frame, all natural products that one, have a hydric buffering capacity, but also help with Natural climate control. So again, you can see one of our windows open. Uh, the whole idea, this is our house in uh, Ottawa. It's still, this was during construction, uh, during the summer. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's been a long, long process. <laughs> who, who, who said that? Oh, Dave, yes. 
I was going to say, I see Chris laughing back there. Yeah, Dave was on the timber construction team who, who worked this. Dwellings did all, all the timber framing, so he, he spent a bit of time on that house, to say the least. Uh, the clay plastering. Uh, how many of you know Pete Mack? Part of our community here, yeah, I love Pete. Uh, Pete really led the team doing most of the plastering on this project, and I can't say enough good things about what he was able to accomplish and what I learned from him during this entire process. So natural climate control, again, getting some cross breezes. We built our entire house in the shape of a U to be able to have two operable windows in every room just to get some cross breezes. Uh, we have a lot of thermal mass in the building, which, you know, again, during the summer months, it does help keep it cooler. It still can get hot, but I mean, with higher ceilings that are vaulted, most of your hot air tends to be trapped up higher, so your cooler lower floors are not quite as Out of the dramatic. shape of the U of your house, which part of the U faces now? This one, the two-story space. Which is what? I'm one, one of the sides? Or uh, the back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the open part of the Yeah. Let's did I think I showed you the outside, right? So here you go. So the two story space and I'll just talk like this. Can you hear me still? Yeah. Yeah. So this is the back two story space I was talking about. South is at an angle like this, so this is primarily facing south at this side. This is more west into the courtyard space. Again, because it's an urban site, you're limited on your land. The idea here is to bring in natural light in as much of the house as possible. So by doing a U, it gives you ample light into every space, which I find is very difficult in a lot of urban contexts because you typically only have windows on one side and windows on the other. And often you have a garage blocking all the opportunities for windows. So by creating a side yard or the side courtyard, it really gives us a lot of opportunities, not only to bring nature in, but us out. And this is a big, big thing I haven't touched on too. With building biology, one of the most cost-effective spaces you can design is an exterior space and will likely be healthier out there than in any interior space. And that's fundamental. So you want to encourage people to have well-designed exterior spaces. Exterior spaces they're going to use. Because that's, that's critical. If it's an exterior space that they want to use, your client or whoever it is you're designing a building for will use that space, guarantee it. And that's kind of the premise of what we're trying to do here is have a front yard, building, side yard, building, backyard. So we're bringing, or we have access to as much of that yard as possible. Did that help answer the question? Yeah, okay. Yeah, so this is the south. That window opening is almost directly south. This is the kitchen area. I won't comment too much on that. Uh, that lovely kitchen island we have in place there. Nice plywood top. Very temporary. Functional. It's functional. It, it, it allowed me to move in, which is, yay. The, the back window here is really why I show this. Um, that's a window wall. That is facing almost southwest. So that's going to get a lot of wonderful light. And our intent there is to really use that as almost a greenhouse space inside of our kitchen. So we, in the winter months, can bring in not only natural light, but growth. A lot of uh, vegetation I would like to grow and can't often inside the city. Uh, it's also, this provides ample natural ventilation. This wall is a sliding wall. So it's an accordion door that completely opens. So we have a 12 foot opening and that opens out into the courtyard. So the courtyard becomes a real extension of the kitchen. Facilitate living outdoors. This is the opposite of that. So this is the courtyard space itself. We have windows on both sides of our uh, two wings, if you will, 
And this accordion wall just slides open and that's the extension out into the courtyard space. Thermal storage capacity. We have lots in this building. Almost too much, but it, it's all good. Uh, yeah, I fell in love with clay, and clay is everywhere in our house. Uh, we have the clay plaster. We have the earthen floors. We have the lovely masonry heater. How many of you have know of masonry heaters? Yes, lovely. Yeah, they're. Uh, it, it's surprising. Uh, I actually had the pleasure of meeting. Do, does anyone know Norbert Sten? Yeah, wonderful, wonderful masonry heater. He, he started kind of, or one of the founders of the masonry heater movement, reintroducing it, if you will. He just lives outside of Ottawa, so he came and did our wet inspection, and wow, what a knowledgeable man when it comes to masonry heaters. The masonry heater, uh, again, I'll speak out over here. Essentially, the way this works is that it's a very large mass heating system. This worked in Europe. It's very, very old technology. Every European country have their own version of a masonry heater that they feel work best. They all work on the same principle. The idea here is that it's an enclosed fire that burns very hot. It runs through channels up to the top and down. So this is a channel that runs through, it runs through the seat and then up the chimney. So you get a very long, very hot burn. And the idea is that you put as much mass as possible around that. So it has a fire brick core with soapstone cladding it. Soapstone retains uh, just a crazy amount of heat. It's, uh, you know, a lot of northern climates, actually there's a lot in North America right up and down the eastern, uh, uh, the eastern board. It's it, like this, this actually soapstone came from Quebec, so it is very local. And there is still, I think, a quarry in, uh, in one of the Carolinas, I believe. Anyway, they, uh, the idea with soapstone is that it retains more heat than almost any other type of stone. So it can retain that heat longer and distribute it into the interior that much longer. Uh, yeah, it, it's phenomenal. The other thing that I do want to mention, I've been introduced to soapstone, so I've been uh, gung-ho about it a lot. Uh, it's the only, wow, the most slip-resistant natural material I've ever found. It's, it's incredible. A stone or a tile floor. I've, I, and I've stepped into, you know, a soapstone entry, and I had wet boots middle of January. So it, it was, you know, I was preparing to fall. Because <laughs> if you ever go onto a tile floor, you need some sort of slip resistance. Uh, the soapstone made me stop in my tracks. Like it's amazing how it works. So soapstone, the way it's built, unlike a lot of other stones, is it's built in layers on top of one another. And with the amount of talc that's in there, it spreads and dissipates the moisture so that your, your foot, when it's on top of it, it comes to, or it has traction. Whereas a lot of other stones, they tend to be granular based. So it's a bunch of almost pebbles, if you will, put together. So it becomes actually quite porous. And there is nowhere, because quite often they're sealed, right? So there's nowhere for that moisture to go. So they tend to be a lot more slip resistant, or uh, slippery, if you will. And tiles are even worse yet. And it's actually the grout lines in tiles that are most slippery, because they are concave, and they allow a little bit of moisture inside of those grout lines. And that uh, becomes probably the most slippery part of that floor. This is 6 p.m. before starting the fire, 24 hours after the last fire. And it's still around 44 degrees Celsius, 40 in the back. And you can see we have a little oven built into the back side. So the radiant heat with the masonry heater, uh, we're at about 48 degrees uh, during the fire burning. Now you can see at the top there, you have a number of 280 degrees Celsius. Can anyone imagine where that's being taken? That's right through the glass. <laughs> so, so through that glass, it is hot. So you are getting a lot of heat from it, but the actual stone itself, which is important, is still relatively cool. 
This is 9 p.m. after the fire burning is complete. So approximately, yeah, just like the fire, for this fire anyway, took about two and a half, three hours to completely go out. We're at about 108 degrees Celsius and the back is close to 80. This is at 12 a.m. midnight, three hours after the fire burning is complete. You can see it's still going up, 120 degrees Celsius. The back is getting closer to 100. The side of it is amazing. This heated bench, if you ever do a masonry heater, put in a little bench. They're not much more expensive and it's one of the most comfortable places you will sit. You sit on there for not even five minutes and you just warm up instantly. But I mean, look, it's 72 degrees and this is three hours after the fire went out. The inside, fabulous. Like, and this is a slow cooker. It's not meant to be used as a real oven, really. It, but, you know, it stays at 150 to 200 degrees almost consistently, 24 hours. When, about three hours after it was burning, I had about a three, four hour spell where it was about 350 degrees Fahrenheit to 400 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's cook enough to, or hot enough to cook most things. So, yeah, it's interesting. Yes? It's warm. You don't want to put your hand on there too long, but you won't burn yourself. Yeah. It just, you touch it and you know something's warm. Yeah, but you won't burn yourself. And that's the beauty of soapstone. Because it does, uh, it retains the heat, but it doesn't get too hot. Some components would be, like some stones or some uh, fire brick and, you know, certain elements could be a little hotter on there. Uh, this is at 6 a.m. when I woke up, nine hours after the fire burning is complete. You can see it's still at 77 degrees and 76 in the back. What I find interesting is at 6 a.m., the wall was at its warmest. So these are some of the clay walls uh, that are beside the masonry heater. And that clay wall is uh, well, it's about 24 degrees there. When I did the imagery of the wall before the fire was started, it was around 19. So, you know, that, that took in a bit of heat for sure. And this is 12 p.m., so 15 hours after the fire burning is complete. It's 63 degrees Celsius, 58 degrees Celsius, so it's still heating a substantial amount. The theory here is that one burning of about 40 to 50 pounds of wood, which is a big burn, big burn, but that one burning uh, will heat approximately 2,000 square feet in a matter of a full day, so it, it does heat a lot. And I'd say this is, after experience it, our primary heating source. We do have radiant floors. They do come on at night periodically in the front end of the house where the masonry heater isn't. But uh, yeah, no, it, the masonry heater does most of the heating. Uh, I have to do a bit more studies. The idea, Norbert Senf has done quite a bit of research on this. Uh, his website's very good, so it does have a lot of background on it. And uh, he's done a lot of uh, North American research. So he's part of the masonry guild, if you will, of uh, North America. So uh, he's very well versed in it. Yeah. Um, from my experience, like if I go outside a half hour after this is gone, we get a bit of smoke at the beginning while the fire is starting to get warmer. Uh, you know, by 20 minutes, half hour later, it is a very mild stream of just, you know, what I would consider very mild smoke. So, and you can't smell it, which is interesting. And most importantly, inside, you cannot smell anything related to it. Yeah, so it's burning stupidly hot. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, that's, that's a good thing. Fine particles and all that stuff, so that's where I'm, I don't know enough about it. Yeah. I just know enough yeah. to be dangerous. So, yeah, but one burn a day is significantly better than the amount of carbon, you know, dioxide that even comes from natural gas. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the alternatives, it's, uh, yeah, the carbon output of a masonry heater is much less than a wood stove or a lot of the other wood burning appliances. I can Basements are tricky, very, very tricky. We do have a crawl space and we do have a sump pump. I want to make sure my footings are dry at all costs. Uh, you know, urban, uh, I think sump pumps are critical in most places, but again, you have to seal that, you have to treat it properly so that a lot of potential gases like radon and everything else don't come through. 
So, so natural daylight, lots of natural daylight, lots of photos. So this is it, the ceiling exposed, plaster on the ceiling everywhere. Big thing here is maximum natural light. This is looking from our master bedroom over top of that two-story space. We have a loft area. Yeah. These lights are interesting. These are those Edison bulbs. They have the, I, I love incandescent. I won't go away. I know everyone loves LED. They're so, yeah, building biology talk a lot. I'm not even gonna go into the discussions with you know, some of the health components that building biology addresses is with LED. But I love incandescent, won't go away. And uh, these Edison bulbs produce some of the most wonderful light way up in that ceiling space. When you're down below, you just feel calm, ready for bed. And that's the purpose of light. We only turn it on at night, and that's really the only time we should, and our body should be coming down. So, you know, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful way. Color and pattern in accordance with nature. Again, this is straightforward if you use natural materials. There is no need to use anything else because the beauty is there in the material. Am I done? Pretty, pretty much. Yeah. So a living building challenge. I'm not going to cut through that too much because that's a whole thing. What I wanted to look at was that there's a health pedal and a materials pedal that are introduced to the Living Building Challenge. Have many of you heard of the Living Building Challenge? Explain yeah. the pedal thing. Explain the pedal thing. There are seven pedals, and these are all the components that you have to attain in order to get your Living Building Challenge certification. There are, it's it's very, a wonderful certification process, very difficult to do. I feel there's still a lot for the organization to develop and learn. But with that said, it is probably one of the most, uh, uh, one of the better certification process to at least attempt to try to attain. Uh, so materials is another one. And I really want to point that out because building biology really was the how and why to achieving this living building challenge. I've spent a lot of time in Santa Fe taking a lot of seminars and I'm soon to be a BBNC uh, certified uh, you know, I guess architect at this point, but uh, the, the building biology is all based on education. It's a non-profit education facility, so they have a lot of online courses that all of you can take. They have a lot of free uh, reports and documents that a lot of building biologists have shared with the organization if you sign up to become a member. Even if you don't, I think you can still download a lot of them. It's a, it's a great organization and a wonderful education tool. Uh, I did want to point out, we have recently brought uh, building biology into my interior design program at Algonquin College, which is phenomenal. We're teaching it at a university and college level, and the whole uh, premise of what we've, the structure that we're trying to create is something that can be repeated at any kind of college or university level and uh, hopefully adapted by other uh, disciplines. Uh, we're talking at Algonquin College to even bring in a little bit further so people can come and attain a BBNC uh, certification and hopefully further certification process as, as we dive into it. But uh, introducing it to my students has given me another appreciation for the education we have to be. I mean, we are the leaders. We are the people who specify and build with this stuff. So if we're not setting an example, who is? With that, thank you.